You're listening to Something Cheeky, a collection of podcasts where two sisters discuss TV, books, and movies with just enough irreverence and far too many pop culture references. Welcome to Something Cheeky, the Gentleman Bastards edition, where we're discussing Red Seas Under Red Skies, book two of the series by Scott Lynch. I'm Nikki. I'm Rosanna. While I've read the entire series, Rosanna has only read up to what we're covering today, which is Reminiscence 1, the Kappa of Velvarazzo. In this chapter, Jean's turning into the Godfather while Locke's been hitting the gin and juice a little too hard. <laughs> All right, Rosanna, we're now really into Red Seas Under Red Skies. What's your reaction to this reminiscence? I liked this reminiscence a lot. We got good. A, we got a ton of good historical information just for the two years of interim time between the end of the last book and where we're actually at in the present. We got a lot of Jean, and I love Jean, and I loved Jean in this reminiscence. He was so great. Yeah. I liked that it was about as long as a chapter. It felt meaty, you know? Yeah, it's a big change from the interludes in The Lies of Locke Lamora. Yes. It's more satisfying for me than the interludes, because so much happens. Yes, it is. And I hope that they continue to be that way. It seems like they probably will be. I do wonder, though, if all of the reminiscences are going to be in this two-year time period. I think they probably are. There are only four or five reminiscences. Right. And then it's just chapters for the rest of the book. I guess I wonder how Scott Lynch will handle telling us historical information without having his little mini-sodes to give information. I guess people will just have to talk about the past. <laughs> What was your favorite quote from this one? There was so much good stuff in it. I highlighted a lot of quotes. I had to pick one. <laughs> the one that I picked has a bad word in it. <laughs> oh no. But you know these boys, they've got foul mouths. There was one line specifically about how Locke let off some stream of invectives that made Jean even blush. Something like that. Even with his foul mouth. Yes, Locke has a very foul mouth. But... The quote that I pick is actually Jean talking to Locke. And Jean spent a lot of this reminiscence frustrated, <laughs> understandably. <laughs> this is what he says. Why did I bother saving your life again? Could have brought the Grey King's corpse. Would have been better fucking company. <laughs> Poor Jean. I really felt bad for him, this whole reminiscence. He was trying so hard to get Locke to get back to his old self. And he was being so responsible. Yes. And then it finally works and Locke just takes off <laughs> full steam ahead. And overdoes it all. Yeah. He got him a little too motivated, I think. Yeah, I really love Gene. It was a great example of all the wonderful things about him that we love. Yeah. Before we get into the action, I have something to tell you that I learned. We've been pronouncing Jean incorrectly all this time. What? Yep. I was looking on Scott Lynch's website, and he has an FAQ page on there. I was reading about the Eldrin. It's Jean. Oh, no. All this time, it's been Jean, the French in the French style. How did we really not realize that, though? I know! <laughs> like, Jean. Usually like Jean like... is spelled G-E-N-E. Well, but Jean, a woman's Jean is J-E-A-N. That's true. I guess I'm thinking Jean from Bob's Burgers, Jean. So it's going to be uncomfortable, but I think we should try to say Jean's name correctly from now on. We're more than a, a whole entire book into the series. And <laughs> I gotta, uh... It's only fair to poor Jean. Jean Tannen. Well, luckily, a lot of times he's not even using his own name. So I guess we'll be okay. I didn't check how to pronounce Tavern Callas. Hmm. Tavern Callas. Maybe it's the two L's like in like in Spanish. Callas. I took French in school, that's all. Then you really should have known that this was Jean and not Jean. I should have. I really should have. I'm putting this all on you. <laughs> <laughs> I will correct my mistake. It's going to be so hard, but I'm going to try. Especially because this reminiscence is all about him. Yes, it is. I'm going to try really hard. Can we just call him Tannen? He doesn't seem as, as comforting. I know. As Jean. Why don't we have a nickname for him yet? I feel like we have a lot more nicknames for the people in Vikings than we do 
or gentlemen bastards. Yeah, the thing about the people in Vikings, though, is they just make it so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, if you haven't heard our Vikings podcast, we have nicknames for almost everyone. We've got Bjorn Iron Man. Mm-hmm. We have Sweaty King Curly Hair. There's Apple Stand, Earl Douchebag, Crazy Eyes, or The Board. He had two names. He did. Oh, and of course, how could I forget? Earl Drunk Swede. Earl Drunk Swede! I was really gl- glad that he didn't last very long. Yeah, that was your first nickname you came up with. Most of the nicknames are from you. And honestly, it's because I can't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. We haven't had lots of nicknames. I mean, maybe because these guys have such interesting names already. And they have more than one name. I mean, they go by several names. That's true. So We've got enough aliases without making up our own. A man has no name, right? <gasps> a girl has no name. Except it's Aya Stark, and she's totally going home. That's tangent, but... She better get home in this next episode, or I'm gonna be pissed. I know, right? I Oh man, I can't wait. Let's get into the action. So there weren't a huge number of things that happened here, but we got a lot of detail on it. We start out with Locke and Jean approaching Belverazzo in their ship. We get some information about Belverazzo. It has some elder glass spires. It sounds like they're basically platforms... And they put convicts on them to sit on for weeks and man these giant red alchemical lamps they use as lighthouses. <laughs> the book said, not all of them come back down right in the head or live to come back down at all. So they're going crazy because they're all by themselves for weeks at a time. Locke and Jean are getting off the Golden Game, the ship that they came from. They had stopped in Talishan. And we learned later in this chapter that they left Ibelius there because Locke was so unpleasant that he just couldn't stand to be around him anymore, which I think is probably for the best. So they have a fresh start here in this book. Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't have stayed on the boat with that guy either. Oh, man. <laughs> it's amazing that Jean didn't throw him overboard. You know, and, and I think that probably he was able to stand it more than the average person because he also was grieving and going through the same sort of things. He was just dealing with him differently. That's true. Even at that point, everybody's got a point where they can only take so much. Yeah. It sounds like both Locke and Jean were both pretty seasick on this three-week journey. They've both lost a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. I remember at one point later in the reminiscence, Jean even says he doesn't know where the weight came from that Locke lost. Yeah. Because, sorry, Jean. Because it's just, he's so skinny in the first place. Right. But even Jean's lost a good amount of weight on this trip as well. And Locke wasn't doing very well before he even went into the fight. That made him so much worse before he got on the ship that made him even worse than that. I mean, he he had a long time of not taking care of himself up to this point. Locke has had a really bad month. Yeah, he has. It's also strange that it's only been a month since all this happened. Less than. Do you ever think that the guys wish they could bring the Grey King back to life so they could kill him again? Just because this has been... <laughs> So frustrating for them ever since he showed up in their lives. It would just be really satisfying. I would be surprised if they thought that. Just to stab him right in the face. Drown him. Bring him back to life. Drown him again. Yeah, do like a flatliners kind of a deal. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Jean has really lost patience with Locke during this trip because he's been just full of self-pity. He hasn't done any sort of exercise for rehabilitation. He's not lost patience. He's run out of patience. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I think there's a distinction there. He was very patient, I believe. I mean, he just, he used absolutely all the sympathy that he had. It's a big, a big difference from when we saw them getting on the ship and they were joking back and forth. Yeah. To now, when there are no more jokes. Also probably close quarters and not feeling well and not eating well and feeling seasick. Even if they weren't in mourning and trying to heal, that's just a kind of a bad situation to be in anyway if you're talking about everybody being in a good mood and still liking everybody. Also, the smell. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you finally start to feel better, and then you go back in the room, and it just smells like vomit because you've both been sick. Can't get rid of that. Locke starting to look a little better. It said, their three weeks at sea had done much to reduce the swelling of Locke's cheeks, lips, and broken nose. But he still looked as though he'd tried to kiss a kicking mule repeatedly. <laughs> I could always picture how these guys look when they describe them that way. They land at Belverazzo, take up residence in a really low-budget inn. 
and Jean immediately goes out to find a way to make money. Belvrazo doesn't have as much of a seedy underbelly as Kamor did. They have crime, but it's not as sophisticated, I'd say, as Kamor had. There's no boss of all the gangs. There's no Kappa. Well, and it's also smaller, right? Yeah, a lot smaller. But Jean does, as any good underbelly does. He finds a need, a gap, and he fills it. <laughs> First with his fists, but then with leadership. He's able to suss out the gangs pretty quickly just by hanging around town. And he goes to the tannery where the brass coves all stay, kind of headquarters. <laughs> he strolls right inside and says, good afternoon. He gave a slight bow from the neck and spread his arms wide. Who is the biggest, meanest motherfucker here? Who is the best bruiser in the brass coves? And someone steps forward and Gene immediately beats him up. <laughs> Just brutally takes him down. And so easily, like it's nothing. And he's not totally recovered either. No. And he still just overpowers him easily. It doesn't even hint that he has hatchets just with his fists. Yeah. They don't even see his impressive hatchet skills until later. So Gene beats up the biggest bruiser and anyone else that gives him any lip. I have to say, I love, that's right, it's Jean. I love watching Jean fight. It's like art. It's just beautiful. He's just so smooth and he has such beautiful moves and he has so many different kinds of moves. He's obviously, his training in the House of Glass Roses Mm -hmm. was comprehensive, it sounds like. Also, this chapter is phenomenal, in my opinion. It's got great fights from Jean. It has so many great lines. The whole fight scene with the Brass Coves is just gold. Tells everyone they're gonna, he's gonna be in charge. They're gonna give him 40% of the money that they bring in. And they're going to be honest about it. You know, whenever they resist, he knocks another one down until they all fall in line, or a literal line, to give him the money they made that day. And he introduces himself as Tavern Palace. I'm thinking at this point, if word gets to Velvarazzo from Camor about Tavern Palace, it's only going to help him. Yeah. In this situation, being so notorious. I think this fight had some of the best lines, maybe, that we've read so far in this series. Gene's just, he's so funny. So he beats up the guy and he says, I'm the meanest motherfucker here. I'm the biggest bruiser in the brass coves. And then some other boy comes at him with a stiletto, which Gene takes very easily. Mm -hmm. And he says, surely you boys can do simple sums, he said. One plus one equals don't fuck with me. (laughs) It's just the lines are so good. We hardly ever hear him say much. He seems so quiet most of the time. Mm-hmm. Not that he's shy, but just Locke talks so much. Yeah. And the Sansa twins talk so much. We never got much from Gene. Yeah. So when he's on his own, we finally get to hear how witty he is. And then he throws some boy into the wall and <laughs> says, added penalty, said Gene, for damaging the wall of my tannery with your head. It's just fantastic. So he tells them he's going to leave and be back the next day for his taxes at a very specific time of day. And of course... They all plan an ambush when he shows up, which he, of course, knew they were going to do. Yeah, they're not very bright, are they? They really aren't. They really need this leadership, I think. They, yes, they really do. It can only benefit them. Yeah. Jean shows back up, but he has the city watch with him, with Prefect Lavasto, who sounds like the perfect straight man for all of Jean's jokes. Jean says that if anything happened to him, the city watch would be very upset, and she says it would be heartbreaking. <laughs> Such thick sarcasm, it's so beautiful. Jean says that they had wanted to be on the take. They were so eager for it, like sad, neglected little puppies. They just wanted to be paid off. They couldn't wait to be part of the corruption. Yeah, this place isn't as corrupt as Camor, but it wants to be. (laughs) It's got corruption goals. (laughs) Just doesn't know how to achieve them. (laughs) Now that they know that Jean has the city guard watching his back, he's in an even better place. He starts making fun of their weapons, and he shows off his skill with the hatchets. Impressive. So impressive. Jean says that he's not just taking from the boys, he's also going to protect them if anything happens. If anyone messes with them, just to let them know. One of them says that the black sleeves across town have been messing with them. Jean, straight out of a one of my favorite scenes from Kingsman, when Colin Firth walks in to the tavern and bolts the door and beats up all the boys. Mm Mm-hmm. Jean does the same thing. Mark, he finds out where the black sleeves are, goes in, bolts the door behind him, and again we hear, who's the biggest, baddest motherfucker here? <laughs> and 
and we know it's the same thing all over again. It's so great. So then Jean has two gangs behind him. <laughs> he is basically the Kappa of El Razo at this point. In two days, that's all it took him. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the boys even started to call him Tav or Tavrin. Yeah. It's so sweet. In the lives of Lock Lamora, we we said several times that Jean was a very motherly figure mm-hmm. to the rest of the boys. And he continues it in this. He's a scary mother. Some mothers are. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on when you catch him. It's true. <laughs> He's very much a mama bear kind of yeah. protector. And he's a teacher, it seems like. It seems like he really got into that role very comfortably. And maybe it's because he had a good teacher. Teachers, really. Maybe. I'd love to see him as a father. Yeah, that would be adorable. Maybe he knocked up the secret girlfriend that we invented in Camor, and he's got a little baby Jean on the way. Petite Jean. Jean Junior. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. Baby chains. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we get to lock was not doing well at all he's a wreck he's drinking way too much more every day it sounds like he and jean keep fighting and jean stops stomps off like an angry husband and leaves and comes back and leaves and comes back and they just keep fighting he plays cards and he's conning people but there's no fun in it for him or us he's just he cons them mirthlessly it said just sounds depressing and they get sick of it too yeah no one will play cards with him anymore he just keeps drinking alone he has lost his mojo too much self-pity yeah john is spending more and more time with the brass copes just to avoid lock and he starts training them with some hand signals and distractions and how to evaluate fake jewels which i love i don't know how many jewels they're actually managing to steal but well at least they're stealing the right ones now yeah I was thinking when I read that he's starting to train them that they're going to leave and, and Velvarazzo will have a far higher class of criminal than when they came. And a higher crime rate. That's true. <laughs> Which is unfortunate. <laughs> for the law-abiding citizens. I wonder if anyone will take over now that they're gone. Oh, definitely. In the position that Jean invented. They were not there very long. What, maybe a week? A few weeks? A few weeks, I think, but not very long. Yeah. Long enough for someone else to get the idea that they could fill that spot. I think so, yeah. But not necessarily for them to be any good at it. No, they're going to be terrible. It's it's going to be some growing pains. <laughs> <laughs> the boys start to fix up the tannery, their, their brass cove headquarters. And Jean even tells them to get a hearthstone because the best criminals can even cook. And of course, I thought of the Sansa twins. Yeah, me too. Locke accuses Jean of finding replacements for the people they've lost and pretending to be Father James. I'm just as mad at Locke as Jean is for this. Jean doesn't think that Locke should use all the people they've lost as an excuse to give up, as easy as it is to do that. I think if Jean had just given up on Locke, Locke would probably have he'd drink himself to death in a couple months. Yeah. Once you run out of money, and that would be that. I think so too. It'd be very sad. John goes downstairs after fighting again, but returns and throws a bucket of water on Locke. He says, you needed a bath, John interrupted. He recovered in self-pity. This reminded me of the scene in The Princess Bride when Inigo Montoya (laughs) is too drunk and Fezzik (laughs) puts his head into the bucket of water and pulls it out, puts it in, pulls it out. He goes, all right, all right! (laughs) (laughs) I imagined... I feel like every single Robin Hood era kind of movie where somebody is sleeping in a pigsty. I feel like they even did it on Game of Thrones. Somebody splashes a bucket of water on them. Yeah. They're always drunk. Jean takes all the wine, all the liquor, all the money, and leaves a little package of something on the table and walks out and locks the door behind him. He just waits outside. Locke gets so angry that he's been locked in. He doesn't even think to try to pick the lock. He's just Mm. mad he's locked in and upset that Jean has the key. And there's a giant baby about it. They yell back and forth for a while. Finally, Locke picks up the lockpicks that John left him and starts to unlock the door. Keeps hearing noises as he does this. Outside, isn't quite sure what it is. And when he finally gets the door open, there is a wall of barrels that John and some other people have put in place that he can't get past. (laughs) It's fantastic. I think that this was a good idea for Jean for a couple of reasons. 
one, just to get Locke up and moving, and two, it really showed that Locke wasn't all the way down because he could have just said, fine, I'll just stay in this room forever. I don't care. It showed that there was a spark still left. I agree. The only way Locke is going to get out of the room is if he goes through the window. He feels like he's too weak to do that. His wrist is still pretty bad. But spurred on by Fury, he <laughs> finally gets past the pain to climb down bed sheets. Pretty tough. And he is three stories up, but he makes it all the way down. And he's still all wet and he's starting to get cold. But John is waiting for him with the cloak because... John is so thoughtful, even when he's giving tough love out. So Locke punches Sean, who then shoves him into a man walking down the street, which I'm sure came as a surprise to no one reading this story. Yeah. Locke immediately pickpockets him. It was great. Yeah. Locke says that he's going to prove he's still got it, and it runs off to go do something. While this plan is what John had hoped for, it's going a little too well. Mm -hmm. Locke is... A little too motivated at this point to show that he has not lost all his skills. So it takes a few hours until he returns. John is pacing and all worried about Locke. Locke, Locke gets back and throws up because he's still having some, some issues with all the wine he's had. He's, I don't know where he's carrying all the stuff that he's stolen. Locke says they're going to have to flee the city because he's gone overboard. He's got a knife, wine, a mug that's made of pewter. A brooch, gold pins, earrings he took right from people's ears. I don't know how the hell he did that without people noticing. I think of all those scenes, which it's another one of those tropes from movies where people are trying to hide from the cops. They don't want to be seen. And so they're with someone who may or may not be attracted to them. And they hide in alley and start kissing. Oh, right. Pretending that they're in a relationship and not running from the cops. I always imagine something like this for this kind of scene, like Locke started making out with someone and stole their earrings at that point. Yeah. I was actually kind of thinking he did it while he was kissing somebody, too. It's a good distraction. Sure. Of course, he doesn't smell good, and he's wet, and he's not <laughs> shaven, and he's ha his hair's too long, and he's skinny, and... I and he's probably still got some bruises on his face. People probably thought he was just some homeless guy. <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't just have those small items, which I can imagine wouldn't be too hard to hide. He has also stolen a whole bolt of silk, a box of sweet meats, two loaves of bread, and a very, very fancy, very, very expensive necklace, which he stole from the governor's mistress while she was sleeping in bed next to the governor. <laughs> and this is when he realizes he's gone too far and heads right back to the inn and says they have to leave. And this is when we start hearing the whistles from the city watch. That was definitely, definitely too far. <laughs> Pretty sure Jean paying them off is not going to get him out of this mess. It is possible, said Locke with a sheepish grin, that I have been slightly too bold. Slightly? <laughs> slightly. <laughs> I actually have another little fight at this point, which is too bad because I was excited because we were starting to get back, back to their, their old personas. Jean doesn't want to leave because he's got a pretty good thing going here. Locke calls him the Kappa of Valverazzo, another Barsavi. Jean says another anything. There are worse things to be. Kappa Lamora, for example, Lord of One Smelly Room. <laughs> so much sass in this chapter. Jean even calls himself an honest working thief, which is a fantastic contradiction. Yeah. But they decide they do have to leave, and they're going to use the apple mash trick make themselves look like they have slip skin, which is even worse than leprosy. It sounds worse than leprosy. Locke convinces Jean to do this. He says, we could smuggle a live cow past every constable in the city at high noon without clothes. <laughs> and he's right. They can figure something out. They can always make it work because they are amazing. Yeah. I really hope that at some point soon they're able to build up their wardrobe again and all their false facing disguises that they have they need more fake beards and hair colors they make it out of out of town super easily because nobody wants to touch them nobody wants them to stay in, in Pelverazzo. nobody's going to search them which is good because they have their money hidden under their, their disgusting disguises they're gonna have to walk along the, a long way which is good exercise for Locke. get him back into fighting shape conning shape quite <laughs> sure what kind of shape he needs to be in for the how about just back in action there you go, back in action. I'm just thinking that, what is that 
boy band song or we're back and the backstreet's back all right hey that's a classic they decide to head to talvarar for some big city cons and baths which is good <laughs> it's great <laughs> necessary We're pretty gross at this point i am very excited to see all the time in between i feel bad for the kids the other gang that he left <laughs> oh i mean they're criminals but you know they finally had somebody to kind of like look up to and to make an effort for and then he just disappears well, it's like the rule of the campsite. You leave things better than you found them. And he did that. I, I, that's a really weird example. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, he showed them that they could be better. And so they can take the initiative now. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they were between 5 and 10 years old. I mean, they were teen to young adults. So I guess I have too much sympathy for them. Do you think we're ever going to see them again? I wonder. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. If Jean and Locke can leave, why couldn't they leave also? That's true. You never know. They might have dreams and aspirations of wealthier marks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know it's possible to get into the governor's mistress's house. So in the next episode, we're going to talk about chapter two called Requin. That is the name of the, we can call him the CEO of this inspire. So what do you think is going to happen in that chapter? So I'm guessing this is going to be in the next couple of days after the end of the first chapter when they won all the money. Okay. I think part of their goals were to get higher up on the levels. So I think they want to meet the guy and talk to him, and I'm not sure why, but it sounds like this is going to be the point where they do, where they're able to. You know, I don't know if they're going to try to do a thing where it's like, let's work together to make something happen. They don't usually do that, even though I've several times tried to get him to. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure they're going to get Are they it. listening to you? Are they not? They really should listen to you. They should listen to me. I think that they're going to give him fake names and a fake story to get them further along in this plan that they have plotted out that maybe they've been planning for this whole time they've been there i would guess they've been working on it what is this plan as we found it's not just that they want to keep getting higher they said in chapter one that they have just been trying to basically get a meeting with him and based on what they won in the last game it's not money because they've got a ton of money now i i don't know money is never their problem it seems like no it's it's never their goal it's just a tool to get them somewhere else well, that begs the question what is their goal in previous cons, their goal had been money for the sake of money, just right, so they could be richer and cleverer than everyone else. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I don't think they're going to go back to the way things used to be, but I'm not sure what their plan is. I mean, are they trying to go for something so big that they can go away and stop? I mean, we kind of talked about last time, like, retiring. I just don't see that happening <laughs> for them. No, it really doesn't seem that way. All we've ever known them to be is the crew of Father Chain's that developed into the gentleman bastards and we know what their goal and purpose was the whole time. I don't know what their individual wishes and wants for life are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I wonder if they know. I don't know if they ever even thought about it. Maybe at some point on the boat, on the journey, they stewed like, like literally also stewed just in their own disgustingness. Oh, <laughs> Maybe just the whole boat ride, and maybe on the way to... Where are they? Telverar? No. I don't know, but every time you say boat, all I hear is, I'm on a boat. Oh my god. I got... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm on a boat, motherfucker. <laughs> the whole time they're on the ship, and the time where right after this where they're traveling, they must have come up with something where they've decided this is something that we both want. But I have no... Uh. I don't know if we've been given any clues to figure out what that e could even be. Maybe they're looking for somebody. Sabatha? They have already mentioned her. It's pretty early on in this book that she's come up, so. They did. Jean said, what would Sabatha think of you at this point? I wonder if they're looking for somebody from Locke's past, like family, and... His long-lost dad that turned out not to be the Grey King? Yeah, exactly, yes. And this person is hard to find, so you have to 
you have to get to people that know people that know things. <laughs> That's an astute analysis, Rosanna. Get to people that know people that know things. Hey, those people are good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they want out of life now that they're in this position that they can't keep going on the way they went before. Are you having an existential crisis for them on their behalf? <laughs> on their behalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What does it all mean? Why are we here? Who are the <laughs> Eldrin? <laughs> Ready, Rosanna, for top three? What's your category this time? These are the top three reasons that I think Jean is a Cancer. And when I say Cancer, I mean astrologically and not medically. <laughs> I believe he is of the astrological sign Cancer, which, fun fact, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> so how serious are you about astrological signs? I'm not very serious about them at all. I never okay. read my horoscope. However, I feel like there is some truth to the characteristics given to astrological signs. When you read a list of this is what a cancer is like. This is the things that are good about them. These are the things that are challenging about them. I I identify with a lot of those things. Cancers are said to be crabby. Yes, that's a true statement. You definitely identify with that. Well, and the thing is, okay, yeah, we, we do get crabby as a whole astrological sign. But if you go <laughs> deeper than that, we have a hard outer shell, but a soft underbelly. So you're like your Reese's Pieces. What? No, gross. I hate Reese's Pieces. You're like an M&M. M&M's are all right, I suppose. Your head has a shell on it. <laughs> your head has a candy shell. Okay. Uh -uh. So, I believe that Jean is a Cancer. I don't know if we've ever been told when his birthday is. I don't think we have. I don't think so. But I'm going to guess end of June. <laughs> okay. So, Cancers are known to be tender-hearted but then they have a tough exterior and i think that gene really shows his tender heart when he's taking care of Locke. He's i agree motherly towards him but he also lashes out because he is also hurting and also in the same regard cancers are usually very dependable i think jean is one of the most dependable characters i think he is the most dependable character in this series <laughs> so far i'd say that i concur <laughs> I should have concurred. Why didn't I just concur? <laughs> the second characteristic of a cancer is they're family oriented. Oh. And I think that Gene got to a new place. Day one, he made a new family. He did it because he they needed money. But it so obviously developed into something that was like a family. He likes to have people around. He's shown himself to be a good teacher. You know, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And then the third characteristic I picked out was that cancers are homebodies. They like to be at home. <laughs> I like to be at home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jean not only takes on this group of, I don't even want ruffians, I suppose, <laughs> and teaches them things and trains them but he also has them fix up the place they live and take pride in their home and decorate and furnish and make it comfortable because it's a home yeah i like that yeah i think that gene is a pretty classic cancer you've convinced me i'm on board yay <laughs> and i didn't even bring up any of the characteristics that they assigned to cancer that are negatives mm. one being very sensitive <laughs> <laughs> but we'll leave that for another discussion you know there could be a point in this book where my top three is three reasons jean is a cancer the negative side <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how he turns out the dark side the dark side this is the light side of cancer <laughs> <laughs> again astronomically Wait, astrologically, astrologically, not astronomically, astrologically, <laughs> not medically. <laughs> so there you go. That's my top three. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear that you agree. I'm excited that 
That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, you've described him very well. He's a good guy. Like Now I'm wondering what all the rest of the people are. Yeah, see, here's the thing. Since I'm only one astrological sign, it's the only one I really know. I'm going to say Locke might be a Taurus. I'm mainly thinking this for his bullheadedness and stubbornness. Do you suppose the Sansas were Gemini? Oh, of course they were Gemini. <laughs> also, according to the internet, Gemini is the biggest gossip of the Zodiac. <gasps> they were definitely Gemini. Oh, they were definitely Gemini. Yeah. I think Bug <laughs> might have been a Capricorn. Oh. Hmm. I'm going to have to say, and I feel bad because I'm a Scorpio, but I'm pretty sure the Falconer is a Scorpio. Uh, yeah. He's pretty intense. Yeah. He is passionate. Mm-hmm. And he is very vengeful. I think Scorpio is supposed to be known for holding grudges and not letting things go, which actually is a point in the Great King's favor for the same sign. Yeah. But I'd say the Great King is probably an Aries. More hmm. fiery. Interesting. Also very selfish. Hmm. So if there are any Aries signs listening, Nikki's calling you selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so send the hate mail in her to her attention. <laughs> I don't I don't know good things about a lot of signs. I don't know much about most of the signs. I really don't know very much about him either. I just know a lot about cancer because that's what I am, so that's what I've read. Same thing with me on Scorpio. But for me, Jean stood out as those prominent characteristics. So it was really easy. Ah. As I started reading through the reminiscence, it just was describing him as a person. Even just the small little period of time, you know, let's say a week's worth of his life. Almost everything he did during that time was so true to his personality. So you're saying that Jean is very much like a cancer who has all these lovely traits and he's maybe one of your, is he your favorite character or one of them? I think that's fair to say, yeah. And you identify with him. I do. Interesting. Why, why is that interesting? What does he do later? Does he do something later? No, I just mean because you like him so much that you see yourself in him. No, (laughs) please. He sees himself (laughs) in me. (laughs) <laughs> have you taken over a gang of ne'er-do-wells lately rosanna and whipped them into shape besides your children i think <laughs> it makes sense though that a character that you like is somebody that you share characteristics with i see that i agree i would totally be my friend my own friend if it was possible <laughs> unfortunately if i was my own friend <laughs> neither one of us would ever leave our own houses so we wouldn't have a very flourishing friendship Skype, it's FaceTime. It's rough being an introvert and then also <laughs> having friends. It's tough. But it's it doesn't bother me that much if I see my friends often because I'm an introvert. I feel like it should bother me more than it does. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for Cheek of the Week, where we talk about something awesome that we love and want to share with you. This time it's my turn to do my cheek. My cheek this week. It's actually a a type of item, a collection of items, if you will. They are Lego minifigures. So everybody knows what Legos are. If you don't, I I don't know how you found this podcast because if you've ever been on the internet, you've heard of Legos. (laughs) Lego minifigures are just the little people, but they make specific kinds of characters and, and different things. I have purchased so many Lego minifigures over the years. Almost never for myself, even. I put them in my husband's stocking every year. He has invented this whole Lego-based game that's really fun. And so I get him little Lego monster minifigures for that. But we have a ton of Lego minifigures. Gotten things, everything from a Yeti to a Medusa to some different kinds of wizards. Some little rock stars with guitars. I got him. Oh, they have this really great set. It came out maybe two years ago or so. But maybe you've heard of it, Rosanna. There was a, they sold out super fast when they first came out. It was a set of scientists with all kinds of equipment, and they were all female. Yes, I did see that. And the set is awesome. So, of course, people were clamoring for the set because it's the first set of its kind that Lego had ever put out of female scientists, females in any kind of STEM field. We've had a million male Lego astronauts, but nothing like this. Mm-hmm. And so it sold out. They finally started making more because people were paying hundreds of dollars for the set you can get for, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 bucks originally. 
And so they finally started making more of them. And so I think last year for Christmas or something, I got I got that set for Ed, and it's so cool. I'll have to I'll put links to all these things in our show notes. But I love the minifigures because you can just they're so t- they're three quarters of an inch tall, and you can put them all over the place. You just assemble them, and they're fun to get, and they really range in price. You can get them I think as cheap as six bucks maybe, but they can they can be a lot more expensive depending on how rare they are too. But I love them because they can just add a nice little, little panache to your shelf, if you like. <laughs> and there's so many different kinds you can get them for almost any kind of hobby someone has or interest that someone has. Like Harry Potter? Do they have Harry Potter mini Lego figurines? Because that's my only hobby. <laughs> <laughs> they have so many Aww. Harry Potter mini figures. They have a whole bunch of Harry Potter sets, too. So, listeners, if you want something to pep up your desk, just get a little minifigure and something that you like. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> also, go out and watch Catch Me If You Can, because it's hilarious. Oh, you sh- yeah. If you haven't seen Catch Me If You Can, you should watch it. It's a good movie. And Kingsman. And then you'll understand our joke. Yeah, that was just a blip early about Kingsman, but that's a great movie, too. I'm so excited about Kingsman 2, the oh, trailer from Comic-Con. Same. So I, haven't, I haven't seen the Comic-Con trailer, but I'm excited about the movie. You're not allowed to because we are going to cover that for our movies show. Yes. I can't wait to see it. I want to know what our listeners' favorite Colin Firth movies are. Tweet us, listeners. Tell us what your favorite Colin Firth movie is. Yeah. Tweet us. in such a range of films. At some cheek and do like hashtag. Favorite Firth. Hashtag favorite Firth. I love it. <laughs> Do you think there are any Colin Firth Lego minifigures? Now I kind of want to see if there are any Mr. Darcy Lego minifigures because I need that. You need like a whole Lego literary collection. <sighs> they, they have a Shakespeare now. I don't have that one yet. Who would want a Shakespeare Lego man? That's weird. What? Who would want a Lego Shakespeare man, Rosanna? That is the real question here. The real answer is me. He even has a little parchment with writing on it. Okay. That sounds cute. All right, listeners, you can visit our website to find information about all of our Cheeks of the Week. You can learn about our other podcasts that we do on books and TVs, and now we're doing movies, which is super fun. You can send us questions and feedback, and you can find ways to support the show. That's our episode. If you liked it, tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you meet on the street. Tell us. (laughs) Tell us. (laughs) Or just leave us a review on iTunes. It actually really helps us reach more listeners, so that would be fantastic if you did that for us. You can follow us on Twitter at SemCheek, where you can tell us your favorite Firth. You can also get us on Facebook.com slash SemCheek, or Instagram at Something Cheeky Podcast. To listen to our other podcasts, just search for Something Cheeky in your favorite podcasting app, or find them on our website. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.